Welcome to the uh, inaugural ArchCon here in St. Louis. Um, I wanted to first start off by uh, thanking everybody for being a part of this event. It's great for uh, us to have more security conferences in the Midwest that are a lot easier for people to get to than a lot of stuff on the, the coasts. And I think we've got a really great speaker lineup today. Um, I think you're going to be really happy. Um, and I'd like to thank all the speakers for traveling. A lot of them had to travel a long way. So very much appreciate you guys for um, supporting the InfoSec uh, community and helping people learn. Um, also, uh, can, by show of hands, who took the training last night or yesterday? Um, special thanks to uh, uh, Liam Randall from Critical Stack. Um, he did a great job. All the reviews were excellent from the people coming out of class and also to uh, Tyler Hudak from CoreLogic with the Malware course. Everybody seemed to really have good things to say. So that was great to hear. And uh, hopefully we'll have them back next year. <laughs> um, just a little bit from the logistics side, just so you know what's going on today. We do have um, a couple breaks, uh, morning and afternoon breaks. So if you'd like to go during that time, go run through the vendor space, that would be great. There's a lot of uh, great giveaways. Plus you can learn about some new technology or services they may be offering. And I would like to definitely thank uh, our diamond sponsors, FireEye, and Acumon, and IBM. Um, especially FireEye and Acumon. I mean, they were there from the very beginning supporting us when this was just an idea and we had nothing. So it was very big to have their support for this conference. Um, lunch will be provided, so we'll be bringing in lunch. And um, we will also have, uh, around 3 p.m., some Monster Energy drinks for people that meet, need to pick me up. And of course, after the event, we'll be having a uh, party up on 18th from about 8 to 3 uh, with free beer and wine for two hours, so that will be pretty fun. Um, it's a nice venue out there overlooking the arch. Uh, we'll have a DJ up there as well. And if you did valet park, please run by the registration desk to get a discount code because you can save $10 off your valet uh, that way. Um, just a little bit about why we did this. So, yeah, there's a lot of conferences out there, trust me. I've learned just through going through this process, there's a lot of conferences. And uh, me and my comrade over here, Mr. Jason Barnes, uh, we were just kind of not really, not super impressed, and there just wasn't a lot going on here in St. Louis that was gonna really teach us things and help us learn, become better InfoSec pros. So after three years, me and him talking, finally we're just like, okay, well, we should do it. We should instead of talking, let's actually do this thing. Um, so we got together and uh, chatted with uh, some uh, local St. Louis people that are big on the scene, like uh, Patrick Crowley from Observable Networks in Wash U. And I'm sure a lot of you that are local here know Jason Clark from uh, Acumon. And both those guys were supportive and uh, lent us their help to get it off the ground. And um, also a big thanks to um, Richard and Charlie Miller, because those were the first two guys that we lined up to talk. And I went to Richard and I said, hey, you know, I don't have any details. I don't know when it's going to be. I don't, I don't really know anything, but do you want to help me out here and talk? And, and no ego, no drama. He's like, yeah, that sounds cool. I'll be there to help you guys. And, and Charlie was even funnier. He said, well, is there going to be beer there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that, that was just, that was great. And, um, being able to work with people that just like to give their time is, is really good because it restores your faith in the community. Where the, you know sometimes there's that kind of rock star, what's in it for me attitude. So all the guys here that are talking today are super nice guys, and uh, walk up and chat them up and learn everything you can from them because they're all smart guys. Um, so in terms of what we're trying to do in terms of the mission and like why we have this conference, one we want something in the Midwest that all the cities, everybody within the surrounding region can get here and. Um, that pretty much is reflected on who's here. So we have about 40% of the people here are from outside the St. Louis area. So that's great. Um, and our key thing that we really wanted to get out of this was a small community feel from a conference. So the, imagine RSA. We want the exact opposite of that. So we don't want crowded hallways. We want a nice community feel where you're going to meet a lot of people and, and just have more casual atmosphere. And then we want a big quality. So the quality of a big conference in a very small venue. And of course, we're nonprofit. We're actually negative profit. <laughs> but hey, it's going to be a fun conference. <laughs> um, so 
actually, we're already talking about next year, so we got a lot of feedback from people, and we're applying that to what we're going to do, and we're going to do more kind of like technical workshops and really kind of get, uh, try to raise the level of people and, and do some cool stuff like that, and we're going to not have as much overlap. We're going to have the talks uh, all in one track, so you can make sure to see every talk, because I know that's one thing here is like there's so many good talks, and you're going to have to pick and choose between them. Um, and we will have um, confirmed Iron Gate recording next year, so that's great. Uh, for the people that like to watch remotely. And um, we had to shuffle it a little bit, so it's going to be towards the end of August this year because we didn't want to conflict with the holiday uh, and Black Hat, Def Con, and of course DerbyCon. So hopefully you guys are making it out to DerbyCon next week as well. Um, another thing that we're talking about since we're talking about education and kind of really helping people out and, and uh, you know, everybody can learn, right? So we want to even make it even more local. So anybody here in St. Louis that's here in St. Louis that's interested in incident response, forensics, or um, threat sharing, all that kind of stuff there. If you're a defender, if you're a frontline guy dealing with threats, please come talk to me about STL forensics. We're kind of in the formative phase right now. We're trying to get kind of like a, a quarterly meetup going where we have presentations and do um, little workshops there and kind of get something going beyond just a happy hour. Because I, I like happy hours as much as the next guy, but we kind of want to develop the community more and, and make everybody stronger. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a few minutes about mentorship. So um, I think there's probably a good mix of people here, people that have been here in the field for over 10 years and people that maybe have only been in the field for like one or two years. Um, and I know when I was coming up, I felt like I didn't even have a mentor. I mean, how many people by show of hands felt like they had a direct hands-on mentor when they got into InfoSec? So like three people. So I started thinking about this, and so back, I got bit by the security bug back in like maybe 01, 02 when you had the big worms like Code Red and Blaster. And I saw that, and I just like, that really sparked my interest, and I started reading everything that I could read, and read it Hacking Exposed, and um, Northcutt's book, and all those early books like uh, Unix and Internet Security, and um, started reading blogs, and, and I was thinking about this two weeks ago. Well. In a way, that is a form of mentorship. You're being virtually mentoring. Somebody actually had to create that. Somebody's creating that content. So that person is mentoring you. And um, what I, I think that that's really powerful. And now we have that technology to collaborate even more. And during that time, I think it was about 04, I finally got my first, I would say, real security job working at the Sprint SOC. And Luke, right here at the front row, worked with me. and. Uh, we were all passionate about uh, the uh, Dow Network Security Monitoring, and uh, we were following the blog, and, and that was one of the key things that really helped us learn about how to run our IDS and how to detect bad guys. And um, I think that you know one of my favorite mentors is uh, this guy over here. He's the author of four books: um, Dow Security, Chief Security Officer of uh, FireEye, and um, I'd like to put your like for everybody to put their hands together for uh, Mr. Richard Bailey, who's going to be giving his talk.
very responsible for what happens. So the, the quality is very high. You just can't blame it on a nameless space as bureaucracy. So I, I appreciate you doing the keynote today. And what I wanted to think about was when you when you go to a good keynote, they're supposed to make you think differently. Sorry, Apple, it's not think different, it's think differently. Every English teacher in the world screamed when they saw the Think Different campaign come out in the 90s. But I, I'd like to have you think differently. That's my that's my goal here. So <clears throat> I'm a little bit of a Civil War history buff, and so I couldn't come to St. Louis without visiting the, uh, the Grant Farm and the U.S. Grant National Historic Site yesterday. And uh, Grant was stationed in Jefferson Barracks in 1843 after he graduated from West Point, uh, about the middle of his class. And he uh, eventually met the daughter of his, let's say, it was his roommate's sister, which happens quite a bit in the academy. Uh, life, which is something not not something that I did, but I experienced that with uh, various cadets that I was I was with in the Air Force Academy. Anyway, while I was there, a guy was wearing a shirt, and the shirt said, and "This is this is like polite company. You know, these are people who are at a historic site." The, the shirt said, "S H I T just got real," and I was trying to think, "What message are you trying to convey?" And then I realized, "Oh, you're talking about information security. That's what you're trying to talk about." And if you think about it, that's that's really what's happening. This year is is just all about breaches. And what I think is even more interesting about that is uh, you've got a couple different factors that people have been talking about for years. We're finally seeing. So breaches are occurring, and stocks are moving. The companies that are getting hit, stocks are going down, and the companies that provide security, the stocks are going down. You're also seeing CEOs and CIOs out, and CISOs in. So that's what happened at Target. Top two layers gone, and they hire a CISO, who incidentally was just put at GM, and before that he was at GE. So this is an interesting dynamic that we have right now. Now, it may seem that uh, things are really bad, but I really want to know, are we doing the right thing? Are we spending our time with the right work? I go to many conferences, I speak at some conferences, I attend others, and I very rarely hear anyone say, are we spending our time on the right topics? We usually delve right into the tactical and the, and the technical areas. You know, what is it we're doing on daily encounters with the adversary? How do we configure our tools? How do we build new tools? Maybe a little bit of organization, a little bit of process. How do we, you know, how should we organize our teams and so forth? But no one actually steps back and says, are we wasting our time? So I tried to think of a situation that's worse off than information security, because I think we could all sort of agree things aren't that great. Uh, just a couple of statistics that sort of give you a feel for that. Last year, the US government, in the form of either the FBI or NCIS, Air Force OSI, some, some, some other military intelligence agency, notified 3,000 companies that they had suffered a significant breach. And about 2,000 of those notifications were done by the Bureau through their third-party notification program. That, to me, is the most important statistic I've ever seen as far as serious breaches go. Anytime you read a statistic that says there's millions of attacks against DOD, or I saw that somebody had a quote of hundreds of thousands of attacks against the financial sector, that's all worthless. I mean, how do you measure an attack? Is it a, is it a, a SIN packet? Is it a, you know, uh, a web, like if someone visits your website and puts a dot dot slash in the URL, I mean, it's just, all of that is, is ridiculous. But to know that there were 3,000 organizations who received personal attention from a government agency is huge. And that doesn't mean that there were 3,000 breaches. What that means is there were at least 3,000 breaches. Because you know, every single one of those companies was probably hit more than once. Uh, many of the times when mandate goes into an organization, we find that there are competing groups of intruders stealing information and doing other things. The record we have right now is seven. You go to an organization, there are, set, there are seven independently operating groups all stealing information. How do we know that they're independent? Because they keep hitting the same things over and over again. If they were cooperative, they'd only go after the cred, you know, credentials once, and then they'd share with their buddies. But no, group one does it, group two does it, group three, group four, and so forth. A couple other statistics. We've been tracking the amount of time for uh, detection to, uh, actually, back that up. When, when we go into uh, a customer, we try to figure out how long has the adversary been there. So sometimes it's limited by the logs that are there, but many times we can get a sense of how long they've been there. 
And the current number we have is 229 days as a median number. So 229 days from when the intruder broke into your organization and when you found them. That's a really bad number, but last year was 243, and two years ago was 416. So those numbers are going down, but I still don't feel good about the fact that you've got intruders in your organization for seven months before anybody notices. And two-thirds of the time, it's an external party that notifies you, like the Bureau or NCIS or something like that. Only one-third of the time you find it yourselves. Now again, a year ago or two years ago, that number was 90-10. 90% of the time, somebody else told you, 10% you found yourself. So again, going in the right direction, but still, that doesn't sound too good. In fact, that's one of the metrics, by the way, of whether or not your security program is really improving. If every time the Bureau visits you, you say, oh, I already know about that, and I've already worked it, you're winning. And when they stop visiting you, you're really winning. But things, I don't think anyone can argue things are really great right now. So I try to think of an area where things are worse off than information security. And uh, my background is sort of national security and that sort of thing, and that's what I turned to. I thought about all the different conflicts that are going on in the world. We just finished it, we're in another ceasefire with, between uh, Israel and, and Palestine. We have, I guess, a truce of some kind going on in Ukraine right now. We've got just a new country being built in Syria and in Iraq, you know, the form of ISIS or ISIL or the Islamic State. And the one thing I hear about, this one word that everyone throws out, you hear wolf blitzer in the situation room, which, by the way, the situation room, I've been in it, uh, the wolf blitzer's situation room, it looks great on TV, but like the table's not very nice, and they, they just somehow know how to push the camera in the right direction so that everything looks cool, but then when you're there, it's not really that cool. So the, the one word I hear over and over again is strategy. What's the strategy? What's the strategy? What's the and you ask, uh, you hear uh, President Obama, and his quote was, we don't have a strategy yet. And that was seen as being, this is horrible. You don't have a strategy? You're the President of the United States, you're the head of the national security uh, apparatus of this country, you don't have a strategy? Well, part of the problem, I think, is people throw around the word strategy, they don't, they don't know what it means. Well, a strategy it actually comes from the Greek word strategos. And strategos, uh, originally, was a Greek sort of political military general. There were 10 of them, and they were elected from the political ranks to both have political roles, but also to lead the army into battle. That's where the term strategy comes from. And so strategy initially had a military connotation. It still does to this day, but now you can have a strategy for anything. You know, I've got my Fitbit on because I'm trying to lose weight. I have a strategy for my diet, right? But not really. The difference between a strategy and planning, or, or a strategy and just trying to make progress, is that a strategy implies that someone is opposing you. It's an adversary, an intelligent adversary. You don't have a strategy against the weather, because the weather is not intelligent. You can do something and the weather isn't going to adapt. But in our world, in information security and also national security, when you're implementing your strategy, you have to assume that someone else is resisting you. So it's that dynamic interaction that makes a difference. And that's why I think if we can pull some strategic thinking out of other fields and put it into information security, we might be able to tell, one, are we doing what we need to be doing? And two, are we getting it better? There's a side benefit that I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, which is why I have a couple of slides that aren't really slides. Oh, by the way, my handle on Twitter is Dow Security, so if I ever get like 100 more followers, that's, that would be really cool. Uh, if anyone tells you they're on Twitter and they don't care about followers, they're a liar. <laughs> Everyone wants more followers, right? Okay. So this idea of, of strategy, I think, is, is the key. So what, what is a strategy? Well, previously, um, before sort of DOD got a hold of it and decided what they were going to do with it, a strategy was just the idea of anything you do before battle. It's sort of arranging troops, organizing them, the big picture, what are you going to do prior to actually engaging the enemy. And when you engage the enemy, that was called tactics. That was what you did on the battlefield, in sight of the enemy, uh, maybe not inside of the enemy, in the cases of long-range artillery or airstrikes or something like that. But that was the main, the main differentiation. Tactics were sort of in contact with the adversary. Strategy is what you did to sort of get ready for that battle. Now, I prefer an expanded definition which has come about in, in recent years, uh, probably over the last 30 years, mainly coming out of the Army. And the way the strategy works is, is this way. Um, there are essentially 
four levels and kind of a fifth one that I've added for information security ops. I'll tell you why that is. At the very top of this process of, of strategic thinking is, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? What's my goal? Why am I here? Very existential question. Why am I here, Paul? I don't it, very existential questions that you're trying to answer. Underneath the level of the policy or the, or the goal that you're trying to accomplish, that's the strategy. The strategy says, here's the way that we're going to accomplish the goal. And you tend to think in terms of three parts, ends, ways, and means. The end is the objective. The means are the tools you have at your disposal, the resources, the people, the stuff that you're going to use. And the ways are the ways you use them. You know, you could have, for example, an airplane. That's 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 a a, a means. The way is what you're going to do with it. You're going to fly it. You're going to park it. You're going to bomb with it. Whatever. And then the end is whatever the goal you're trying to achieve. So a strategy is a way to connect ways with means to accomplish an end. The third part of strategic thinking is what you do over the long term, and those are called operations or campaigns. This is what you're going to do over weeks, months, maybe years, to implement your strategy to accomplish your goal. Now, I didn't realize initially this is what we were doing when, so I know Paul and actually all most of these guys that are out here uh, from our time at General Electric. But we adopted a campaign methodology when we were at GE. And we adopted a campaign methodology, meaning what are we going to do over weeks, months, and years? Because this was a problem we were involved. Well, we were facing problems that weren't going away. They, because the bad guys were always coming at us, we had to think about what are we going to do over weeks, months, and years. And this is this level of campaign planning is perfect for that. Below the level of the campaign is tactics. What is it you do when you're in contact with the adversary? What is it you do on a daily basis? What is it, what is it you do when you're in the heat of the battle? That sort of thing. The, the fifth and final level is technology. Now, I put technology in there. It's not really listed explicitly in, in like the DOD model, but I think it's really important because it's what, what a lot of us bring to the fight is, is our passion or interest in, in technology. Now, I know FireEye is a diamond sponsor, and FireEye has lots of cool stuff you can buy. So I don't want to sort of imply that by putting technology at the bottom, it's the least important thing, but in some ways, it can be. Because if you don't do that process of the strategic thinking, you'll find that you could buy stuff maybe you don't really need, or it's not really solving your problem. So I want to talk a little bit about that. How many of you have tried to get justification for a new project, or a new piece of equipment, or new hires, and you try to use terms like return on security investment? Nobody's going to raise their hand. Oh, you guys are raising your hand. All right. We got a Green Lantern shirt on. He's not afraid of anybody. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, or maybe you have to talk about, I'm enabling the business. I was a CISO, by the way, when I went before FireEye, when they did, prior when they bought us, or sorry, when, yeah, sorry, got it back. Um, Mandy was purchased by FireEye, so I was a CISO at Mandy. Um, and then at GE, obviously, I had to say things like, oh, I'm enabling the business, and then I would sort of take a shower because I felt dirty for saying that. <laughs> um, but you did that because you were trying to communicate a need to, to management. And what I realized was that this whole language of so speaking the language of the business and those sorts of things, that to me wasn't really the best way to approach this. And, and so we had sort of what I have here on my slide, it's not a slide. You have sort of maybe five levels of a security organization. You've got at the top your board and your CEO, these sort of set the overall agenda for the company, try to keep it on track, and that sort of thing. You have a CEO and a CIO, and basically the other parts of the C suite, you know. The, marketing officer and all sorts of people, chief financial officer and such. The third level is the CISO, the security director, someone who's responsible for a security program. And this is a, this is a job that's been getting a lot more attention recently because many companies don't have CISOs and they're, they're tired of them now for the first time. Then you have your security staff. These are the people who are responsible for getting real work done in any company. Um, sorry, no offense CISOs or security directors or anyone ever hire who's here. I, don't, I guess they're on your CISOs. 
Uh, and then finally, you've got the vendors. I put the vendors on here because vendors are becoming more and more important. It's managed managed service providers, people provide with tools, um, so that we don't want to forget about that. So typically, what you have is this. You've got a CISO and security director who makes a budget request up to get uh, results, or they're asked to provide security briefings. How are we doing? Are, is everything on the dashboard green? What does that mean? And that sort of, that sort of thing. And then the tactics are something that the security staff does and the tools are provided by the vendors. Well, I find that if the level of conversation is like this, you get sort of weird interactions between the security director or the CISO and the upper, upper parts of the organization. They do things like, say, we need to justify buying Splunk, or we need to justify hiring some new people, or whatever it is. And there isn't really a real conversation about whether this is the right thing to do, should we be doing this, how do we know we're getting better, any of that. And so you end up falling back into this saying, well, if we buy this product, we'll save X amount of money. Which, come on now, everybody knows that's kind of, that's not really true, right? Because then you find more stuff, and that requires you to do more. And so security, at the end of the day, for me, at best, it can be a loss prevention mechanism. It really isn't. You're not making my own security. The one example that is not is really a fraud department. Uh, I think uh, fraud departments can potentially make some money, but that's, that's another issue. So I look at this, and I think this is kind of broken. So I'm going to offer you an alternative that's based around this idea of, of strategic thinking. And by the way, uh, the fact that there are five levels, and a few minutes ago when I told you about the five levels of strategic thinking, that's, if you were looking ahead, congratulations, you figured it out. Okay, so my second slide that's on a slide. What I recommend you do is you have a conversation. When I say you, this is probably the security director. If you're a CIO in this audience, um, you can have this conversation as well, but I think you should bring in your security director or your CISO. If you're on the security staff, this is something you need to encourage your CISO to do. If you don't have a CISO, promote yourself. Become a CISO. Uh, I think the CISO is a really important job. I think it's sort of the linchpin uh, among all these different levels. So I really think organizations need to have a person with this responsibility. So what I recommend you do is you go to your board and your CEO, and you want to have this sort of conversation where they think they're coming up with all the ideas but really it's your ideas. But don't worry about that. As long as they're speaking your language, you win. When I worked at GE, I used this technique a lot on uh, my boss, who was Grady Summers, who now works at Mandia. And I knew I was making progress with Grady, because he was the GE CISO. I knew I was making progress with him when I heard him saying my sentences to his boss, the CIO, and father of the organization. And I said, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, you're making progress now, yes. Uh, now, if you can't get that done, then maybe you want to look at something, you know, some other opportunity. But um, you want to be able to get your views through someone who will, who will champion them and has some power in the organization. I was a director of incident response, and I was an army of one when I first started in 2007. So I had to build that support to agree. So what you want to do is say, hey, board and CEO, what is the goal of our security program? What are we actually here for? What do you want us to be here for? And you'll hear things like, be secure. And if you hear be secure, you got to take this as a teaching opportunity. Because be secure is stupid. There's no such thing as be secure, right? You just can't be secure. Uh, they might say we want to be uh, best in class security or world class security. And of course, what's down the line, we tell them what that costs. They'll say, well, what is our, what is our uh, competitor do? We just want to be slightly better than that or just as good. Or you might get a compliance answer or something like that. But what I, what I recommend you do is guide them towards something that you can use for your own purposes. But make sure it's, they, they think it's their idea. And they, I'm going to focus on intrusion here. You could easily do this for other issues. Denial of service, availability, whatever. But I'm going to focus on intrusions here because we kind of have a DFIR flavor to this conference and that sort of thing. So the goal I want you to guide the board towards is minimizing loss due to intrusion. So you say the goal of our security program is to minimize loss due to intrusion. There's a lot of concepts packed into that. Minimizing loss due to intrusion means, or implicitly accepts, bad things are going to happen, but when they do, we want to make sure they don't kill us. We don't want to get on the front page of the newspaper. We want to handle this as, as well as possible, minimize the cost, all these sorts of things. But it implicitly accepts that bad things will happen. If you can get over that first hump, that's a big deal. 
because so many organizations still think bad things will never happen to them. It's happened to every, every other retailer, it's happened to every other energy company, every other aviation company, it's happened to every other school, every library, whatever. It's not going to happen to us. Well, thankfully that, that attitude is changing, but you want to bake this, this idea in. It's so, okay, minimizing loss of intrusions is the goal we're trying to accomplish. Next, you're going to drop down. And by the way, you can have this conversation with the same group. Just make sure the CIO is involved. And the CIO will probably be there because of that board meetings for security and stuff. So the next thing you do is you say, well, we need a strategy to make sure that your awesome goal that you came up with independently due to your uh, incredible years of brilliance uh, can, can implement. And the strategy that I recommend here is, and again, there can be many strategies, and of course, you know, many goals, but the strategy I'm recommending here is rapid detection response containment. So what that means is, when bad things happen, we're going to notice it fast, we're going to do something about it fast, so that we minimize the loss due to intrusion. Now, there's so many things that you can probably think about, all the things we're going to need to make this happen, but that's okay. We're trying to get them to buy into simple language phrases that they understand without any technical background. Because you don't need to teach them how to uh, write a compiler or to analyze a packet. They don't need to know any of that kind of stuff. You just need to get them conceptually bought into this idea. And by the way, this is just a way of approaching this. You can have your own ideas, but this is the one I'm using as an example. So they say yes. They nod their heads and say yes. We, we independently discovered this idea of rapid detection response containment. And they really were talking to their buddies on the golf course and they heard, heard about this. Okay. So, if you can get these two things done, you get them bought into the goal of the strategy, you are almost home free. I mean, this, this could be very, very useful for you. Because the next part is where you as a security person have more or less direct authority and you can start doing things yourself. This is where you come up with the operations and the campaigns. So you say, what are the things that I need to be doing every week, every month, on a yearly basis, to implement my strategy to accomplish the goal. What are the campaigns that I'm going to run? What is a campaign? So a campaign is, is a set of actions, hopefully that you're taking with some initiative. In other words, you're not just reacting to the enemy, enemy's campaigns. You're applying your own campaigns to the adversary. And I offer two types of campaigns that you can run here. A match campaign and a hunt campaign. What does this mean? Well, a match campaign says, we are going to have indicators of compromise, things that we can use that tell us when an adversary is present, or maybe was present in the past, and we're going to apply that to data that we collect from our enterprise. And there's four places you can collect data from in any enterprise. One is from the outside, so people tell you stuff. You, know, you get a call from a friend, you get a call from uh, the bureau, you Maybe you can also uh, internalize this as well. You get a, a user report, something like that. Something from outside the security organization tells you something bad might be happening. <laughs> Second place is on the network. So you watch traffic and that sort of, you know, find things. Third place is from your logs. And this is mainly the place where you can do the cloud these days, because cloud is still kind of tough. You're starting to see some small startups, some uh, vendors coming up with cloud offerings, a uh, couple that were well, we can talk about that later. Uh, and then finally, um, the endpoint. So the, the device, the computing devices themselves, you can instrument them, uh, pull logs off them, capture memory, all sorts of things. So those four places. You're going to gather information, you're going to apply threat intelligence to it. Ooh, threat intelligence, big buzzword from RSA. Everything from RSA was about threat intelligence. The other thing that I saw at RSA, everything's advanced. If you have a normal security program, you're a loser. You have to have an advanced security program. <laughs> oh, that's unfortunate. Okay. So that's the matching side. All the stuff that you're gathering, you look for bad things in it. What you find, you act on, it's over. The hunting campaign is different. The hunting campaign says, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'll know when I see it. Now, I know many of you have heard those words associated with something else. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's from a Supreme Court case from the 70s involving Larry Flint or something, so you get a flavor with that. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's not the campaign we're talking about. What I'm talking about is you get the smartest people you have in your organization, the people who are the most creative, the people who know how to find this sort of odd thing, who are interested in having time, and they go out there and they search through all the data that you're collecting. Or 
maybe they do a random uh, acquisition of a laptop, or they notice that they had an executive just come back from China who had an interesting app installed on their phone and wants to take a look at it. These are the people who some people call them. Uh, uh, what do we call them? <coughs> what were you? It's a handler. That's right. Sorry. He's pointing to David over there. I forgot. Uh, these are the people who are out there looking for things that no one has an indicator for yet. They're 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 looking for stuff that nobody knows what it looks like. And this is one of the ways to deal with intruders who get past your defenses. If there's no indicator for it, how are you supposed to find it? Well, at that point, it's, it's, it's person versus person. It's, it's the offender against the defender, and creativity is, is the main uh, skill that you can bring, bring to that fight. And that's what a hunt campaign is. Something we did when we were at uh, General Electric was we had our incident responders have, uh, they were called hunting trips. And a hunting trip ha happened like the following. You'd have the, uh, the incident handler set up a WebEx or ReadyTalk, whatever it was, and the junior people, or anyone else who was interested in that matter, uh, on the security team would, would watch that person's screen, and the, and the uh, incident handler would just go through data looking for something interesting. And the other people would say, why are you looking at that? Or what made you look, you know, what is odd about that? And so forth. And you go through this process of finding something new. And you all know, anytime you spend five minutes with your large, you're going to find something that, you, that, that was odd, that you didn't expect. And you dig at it, you pull at it, it turns into something. Well, the goal, so you've got something right away. But then what you want to do is turn that, the output of that hunt, uh, the hunting trip, into a match so that you just have a computer do it over and over again in the future. And so over time, you can run these two these two sorts of campaigns. There's other campaigns you could run. You could run user awareness campaigns. You could run uh, better instrumentation campaigns. You could run red team campaigns. There's all sorts of things you could do. I just offer that as a couple of examples. All right, so now we're at the level of tactics. And tactics is where your security staff is in direct contact with the adversary. And this is where you get into the DOD, DOD idea of active defense. When I hear active defense, I think most of you, when you think of active defense, you think of activities beyond your network, activities on somebody else's network. What they mean is it's activity on your network, but it's not passive. In other words, it's not just you sitting back and letting your tools, you know, your firewall block and your whatever, do whatever it's doing, but you're out there looking for stuff or interacting with the adversary, changing the environment as, as you, you find the adversary. So this is the level at which things that you're doing are finding intruders, uh, cutting them off, resolving incidents, and that sort of thing. And then the final level we have here is the level of tools. And this is where you bring in different software, maybe the stuff you write, maybe the stuff that you buy, stuff that you prototype, and you hire somebody else to put into production, whatever. Now, I put tools at the bottom. I know my colleagues who sell tools are like, no, 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 tools are at the top. Buy my thing, it will make you better. Yes, please, check. Yo, it's the end of the quarter, or whatever. Okay. Tools are important, but they should be the end of this process. It should not be the thing you go in with. In other words, I've heard people say, my strategy is to buy Cisco. No, that is not a strategy. What you should do is say, given that I'm trying to uh, equip my security staff so they can implement their tactics while they're doing their campaigns and supporting the strategy to accomplish a goal, Put all the tables in. Um, you want to give them the right tools. You want to give them the thing that they need. It's also important that the uh, strategy that you that you buy, or that you buy, huh, you can't buy strategy. The strategy that you want to uh, follow is technically feasible. For example, maybe your strategy is listed it says rapid detection, response, and containment. What are some of the things that could cause you to not be able to do that? Here's an example. You say, we're going to instrument all of our networks, and we're going to find intruders. Well, what if you work in a place, and I've heard, I've heard this about Microsoft. I don't know if it's still true or if it's sort of an apocryphal story. But my understanding of the Microsoft network is it's all uh, IPsec encrypted. So if your network is completely encrypted, and you put a sensor on it, you're not going to see anything. Now, maybe you could get out to the gateway, get out to the edge of the network. You could see things leaving and going out to the internet. You know, OK, you can do some things there. There's lots of us have done interesting things there. But if you're operating in a mainly encrypted environment, 
you're going to have a disconnect between the tools that you apply, uh, the tools that you apply, and the strategy potentially. So you have to come up with a different strategy. Even. So it's important that you have this linkage between what it is that you're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what's happening at the top. Now, the reason I like this approach is that when you eventually need to go to management and say, this is what I need, you don't say, right, you know, give me a PO or give me money to buy this product. You say, I need this capability in order to implement your strategy and accomplish your goal. Because remember how smart you were? You independently came up with that because of your brilliant years of experience on many corporate boards? This is why we need this. It's implementing the strategy. You don't talk about, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the neatest thing from Cisco or, or whatever. You say, this is, this is going to get, you, what you wanted is going to get done. That's why I'm so uh, big on that. Okay, that's the last of my slides without slides. I wanted to mention one other sort of uh, thinking topic that I heard uh, mentioned recently. And Bruce Schneider is going to be talking today. I don't know if he'll mention it or not, but he did mention it in his Black Hat talk. And he brought up the idea of the OODA loop, which I almost fell out of my chair when I heard him talking about this, because the OODA loop was developed by an Air Force colonel named John Boyd uh, in the 80s and the 90s. And what the OODA loop refers to is a method of interacting with your environment based upon four main pieces. John Boyd was a, was a fighter pilot. He, he fought in uh, Korea and Vietnam. And he, he took his concepts of, of fighting adversaries and tried to come up with a way to think more strategically about it. So OODA is what UDA spells out. And the, the, the letters stand for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. In other words, you take a look at your environment, you figure out where you fit into that environment, you make a decision about what the best way to operate is, and then you do something about it. Now, many people, and Bruce included, this is why I bring this up here, get sucked into the idea that the OODA loop is just about speed. In other words, if you just do this thing faster than the adversary, then you're going to win. That's partly true, but it's not the whole story. The real story, and this is what Boyd was trying to emphasize with the OODA loop and other parts of his work, was that you're trying to accomplish this to disrupt the enemy. You want to disorient the enemy so that they, not that you're just doing things faster than them, although that's a, that's a benefit as well, but you want to be at the uh, execution of your actions to disrupt, disorient, and in many ways disable the adversary. And it's through this process that you get you come up you come up with what's called strategic paralysis. You're trying to get the adversary to the point where they don't know what to do. They, they are just totally confused. Now, when you think about this, this is often what happens to IR teams. If you are, and, and I've seen this many times, and I just saw it recently, and it's kind of, you know, kind of disappointing. But if the adversary has a complete initiative, they own all your important stuff, they have all of the strategic high ground in your enterprise, they, they own the centers of gravity of your domain controllers, all these sorts of things, you as the IR team can just feel completely helpless. I don't know what to do. I just did my third password reset, and now I need to do a fourth one. What's going wrong here? Well, this is where you go to the area of I'm doing the right thing, right? Okay. So we need to figure out a way to try to get it turned in the other direction so that the adversary doesn't know what to do next. That's what we're talking about with the Noodle Loop. You're not just doing things faster. You don't just want to be a hamster who can, who can go around the wheel faster than the adversary. You want to figure out a way that you're making it tougher for the adversary to accomplish their job. Um, there are some ways you can do this, but again, this is not something that just happens overnight. An example we had in uh, our previous job was instrumentation. As we rolled out more and more instrumentation, it was moving the adversary out of certain parts of the network to the places where we didn't have instrumentation. And in this case, it was in places in Europe. The last parts of the company that we were able to instrument were France and Germany because they had such anti, such strict anti, uh, or, sorry, pro privacy laws. So it was taking us months and months to get additional instrumentation out there. So the adversary knew this and was simply stealing data from those locations until we could do something about it. Now, of course, once we had tightened up that, they went to another part of the network. They went to third-party connections. We tightened up that, they went to the VPN. After that, they went, you know, you, this is why you need a campaign mentality. You just can't simply say, well, we do this and then we're fine from here on. <coughs> so 
trying to introduce some of that disorientation to the adversary. Now, the thing that they were trying, that, the thing that they were doing before that doesn't work anymore can be, can be very frustrating. We've seen this uh, with some of the, the interactions we've had with, with adversaries who uh, we swap out their tools. So they think they have their tool installed, but it really isn't. And they're trying to implement commands, and things aren't working. And you see them try, 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 try. And then they stop. And then they have to figure out, what did I just do? And then they go about this. They're trying to uninstall it, whatever. You see this quite a bit of honeypots. I'm not a really big fan of honeypots, but it's really fun to watch some of these guys poke and poke and poke. And you know, OK, the LS command works, or whatever it is they're trying to do, and other things don't work. Uh, it really introduces a sense of, of uh, shock and awe to those guys. <laughs> So I hope that um, introducing this will give you some ideas of when you need to go to your security, you know, you're, you need to implement a better security program, you need more resources, you can try something like this. I've, I've been briefing this now for about nine months, and I've had lots of organizations try this, and it's, it seems to be getting some traction. Um, of course, you have to think about, you know, what is the strategy that's going to work for our organization, but uh, I don't think there's... There aren't that many, and maybe that's some, some work for, for research to find out whether or not, uh, you know, what sorts of strategies will work. Um, I think that's all that I wanted to, to cover. I have my, uh, my list of notes here. Is this when I get to give out the goodies? Okay, so I'm happy to answer questions, but to get you in a really good mood, or some of you anyways, Paul has hidden, or one of your minions, I'm not sure. Um, I have four copies of my book on that table. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a thing like Oprah where you look under your table, everybody gets a book. You didn't have that kind of budget. Uh, but Paul has taped four ping pong balls underneath some of the chair, one, one per chair. So if you reach under your chair and find out that you have one of these taped under your chair, then you get a free book. And if you don't, and I don't see, okay, so there's one. There may be a bad scramble for all the other chairs that are open. Right? There are a lot more chairs than people. So we still just have one found? I've never seen this at a conference. This is really amazing. This is worth coming out here for. Oh, my chair, yeah, my chair is over there, I don't think. Uh... So do, do we still just have one? It's all yours. Well, when it, whoever finds it and wants to come over and, and get a book, we'll be happy to give you one of those. Um, at this point, we have about 10 minutes on the schedule for <coughs> questions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'll go to Sir first. Yes, uh, hi. I, I think this... Uh... Um, the picture you painted of applying uh, military strategy to sort of info strategy, it sounds completely watertight and very compelling. So I think it's, it's terrific. I, it'll, I'm sure it'll work every time. But the thought did occur to me that the, um, in recent years, the, uh, what we think of as traditional military strategy has stumbled a little bit uh, in these so-called asymmetric uh, conflicts. And right. I always thought of sort of InfoSec as being the purest, or you know, cyber generally being sort of the purest form of, of, of asymmetry. Yeah. Have, you, have you thought about that at all? Is that yeah? Is that a great you? question. The, the, the question was about asymmetric warfare. So there's an interesting dynamic to play with asymmetric warfare. The U.S. military has gotten so uh, so powerful that there are no real near what they're called. Uh, uh, they're, they're called, I can't remember the term. Who are my military guys? You know what I'm saying? Something competitor. Near competitors? Near peer. Near peer, or peer competitors, yeah. There are really no peer competitors to the U.S. military. Now, the other militaries in the world are stupid. If they realize they can't go head on against us, tank for tank, plane for plane, uh, ship for ship, they're going to fight asymmetric battles. So, by definition, everything is asymmetric when they fight, when they fight us. What's funny too, when the US military talks about how they want to fight others, they don't talk about you know, war of annihilation. You know, they say, what is the way we can be asymmetric? Where can we find the weaknesses and apply our strengths against their vulnerabilities? That's kind of an asymmetric fight as well. So 
Everybody wants to taste method. But I think the core of your question is, when you're dealing with things like, are we at war with ISIS? You know, their method is primarily information warfare to, to, to build up their own forces by gaining adherence, which helps them gain ground, which helps them get money and stabilize their, their state and that sort of thing. And their main weapon against us is, is terror, you know, horrible videos. And our main weapon thus far has been airstrikes, uh, trying to build coalitions, trying to get other people's boots on the ground, Peshmerga, Iraqi forces to do the fighting for us. So yeah, absolutely, it's, it's a totally different fight when you compare that to World War I when you had you know, tens of millions of people mobilized, or World War II or that sort of thing. I don't think that necessarily this stuff falls down though, and it just takes a while for the combatants, particularly the United States, to figure out how to operate in that environment. And you see people like, like David Kilcullen and Petraeus and these other people eventually figure out ways to try to, to try to work on this. And I think it involves, sometimes it involves ways that we just wouldn't think of, like the surge, everyone thinks of the surge as pouring, you know, pouring troops into Iraq. That was part of it, but it was also paying over $300 million to Iraqi Sunni tribes to fight Al-Qaeda. What? I mean, there was, this, there was a great frontline episode about this, where they showed, you know, you know, army majors counting out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000, thank you. 10, 20, you know, counting out big chunks of cash, and these guys, you know, they're like, it's, they're, they're taking all the money. But guess what? It worked. The surge worked because we were able to get them to fight uh, against these, uh, you know, radical uh, Soviet Uh Let's see. Sir, yes. So you didn't talk much about uh, threat actors in, in this convincing of management. And yes. This, uh, you know, who would do it and the likelihood. Yes. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you work that into those various elements, and especially when you're dealing with high impact, low frequency events, where maybe there isn't good data available to, to make your case that, you know, from a strict number standpoint. Okay, so um, I think there was sort of two parts to that question. We didn't talk about threat actors, and also how do you make the case for low frequency, high impact events. I didn't talk about threat actors because I'm so tired of talking about threat actors. Um, it seems like uh, I just got another request. Uh, we want you to go to this conference and provide a threat update. Uh, uh, no, I will not provide a threat update. I may say I will, but once I get on stage, forget it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think at this point there's so much pretty good stuff out there that people could read about the threat. When people, if they ever want to know about the threat, like for example, I did a, a, a little private talk for a bunch of law firms the other day. They wanted to know what are you seeing against law firms. Not just general threat, but what's happening at law firms. So I think that that's um, one thing you can do. You can say, who is my audience? They want to know what's happening in their sector. Even better, what's happening in their company. You can get that information. Sometimes there are ways to do that. So that's one way. Um, as far as the low frequency, high impact events, that is very tough to handle. The only way I think you can sort of deal with that is to say, if it's happened to somebody else, if it happens to you, I don't know, I mean, if you're trying to anticipate it happening to you, most people just don't believe. It, I mean, how many of us worry about error of object collisions? We will where it happens, but, and it's happened every 65 million years, and oh, the last one was 65 million years ago, oh my goodness, this doesn't sound good. Um, but until, you know, you can say, well, it just happened to this planet XYZ12, and it got wiped off the unit, and yeah, that's so far away, it's not us. So I really don't know a way to deal with that yet. I mean, the way that the U.S. military deals with it is you've got the Cheney Doctrine on one hand, which is if there's even a 1 in 100 chance that it will happen, we blast them out of the water, which is what happened in Iraq. That's what he said. If there's a 1 in 100 chance that we have that our WMD in Iraq, we're taking them out. So we're taking them out. You've got that model, then you've got the model of, of all the priorities and things that are happening, I'm going to focus on the things that happen to me right now which is what you see in some of these other areas. So that, to me, is a, is a really tough question. Any other questions? Sir, in the back. Yeah, yeah the, another big buzzword that's come up last couple of years is offensive security. This yeah. concept that we, we respond, you punch us in the nose, we'll punch you back in the nose. Right. Aside, from, uh, aside from defense, uh, for those of us in the private industry, do you think there's anything to this? What do you think is the, is the necessary, how necessary do you think it is to be building offensive security? 
So as far as as far as offense goes, the party line that I'm instructed to say is that we do not uh, we neither condone nor advocate uh, striking back at adversaries. My personal opinion, though, is that there are different ways to do offense. There's counterforce offense, and then there's actions taken against uh, affiliates or supporters or infrastructure. So counterforce means if I identify, for example, David is attacking me, and I identify his computer as being the one that is attacking me, I can do a counterforce activity against him directly. Maybe or maybe not, that will have some kind of effect. But I could also consider if, for example, Liam's computer is compromised, and he's an innocent bystander, do I do something against that? Or, uh, you know, Patrick and Paul, they are, they're providing funds to David, or they're hiring David or something. So there's different options as far as who you might go after. I think at this point, we're still, I don't see any official, legally sanctioned, either counterforce or counter support uh, options available for the private sector. I know there are some private sector companies that are taking that, uh, you know, they're taking the situation in their own hands and they're doing what they think is necessary. But that's been happening for a while in sort of related areas as well. I mean, I remember uh, I did an insert response for a company who had fraudulent orders and there were items that were on an export control list being shipped to Iraq. This is pre Iraq war. And so they wanted to figure out who was doing this. They hired private investigators. They tracked this thing back down to a guy in Romania who's working for Romania on organized crime. They talked to his mother, all this sorts of stuff. I think that what you'll find with, with computers and cyber, uh, bringing the term from the bellman, everything's a cyber this and cyber that, um, you may find that your options for, for offense are better handled outside of computers. In other words, you do things against the, the state or the actors or whatever, but you don't do it through a uh, computer, computer means. But some kind of an early stage as far as what's going on. You'll, I don't think you'll ever see the U.S. government say, yes, you can do this. I just don't see it. To them, there's no, there's no, there's no real upside, I think. The upside is for you as a company. They only see downside. They see international incidents. They see you stumbling around on the systems that they've compromised. They see you potentially attacking them, right? They, they're like, oh, you're on my infrastructure. So I don't think the government sees any upside. They see only downside. And also, I think your lawyers would see no upside. They would see only downside. And the lawyers tend to have a final say in a lot of these different conflicts. Any other questions? All right, your timing, your sense of timing is impeccable. It's uh, 920, so we have a 10 minute break. And then after that, Mr. David Bianco will be here speaking. And if you found one of those ping pong balls, I will sign your book. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jason. Hope you guys enjoy the conference.